All right, yeah, thank you very much for coming today. Even though the topic might not be that appealing in the first place, but it is actually a title directly from the Bible. And uh, this presentation today is a continuation of the past three presentations where we talked about the second coming of Christ. And uh, we saw a couple of signs that announce the second coming of Jesus Christ. I think one thing for us to really understand is God is a God of time. He has a timeline. He doesn't do things randomly. Just like us, we also don't do things randomly. Yeah? You have a class, you know exactly time and place. Things go by schedule. God is the same. He has a time plan. And for example, when Jesus Christ came for the first time, about 2,000 years ago, even his first coming was according to God's timing. He didn't come on a random date, but he came exactly according to God's clock. And uh, if Jesus Christ came the first time according to God's clock, he will also follow God's schedule for his second coming. Right, and some of the signs that proclaim and announce the coming of Jesus Christ, we've seen them in the previous three presentations. And if you weren't able to come, uh, we have them all on YouTube. So you can go ahead onto our channel and, and watch them so you get uh, a good background. <clears throat> so, and today we would like to continue and speak a little bit about the great day of God's wrath, which is maybe known as the so-called Great Tribulation. Now, many Christians know this term, Great Tribulation, and, uh, but the Bible actually calls it in the book of Revelation, it calls it the Great Day of God's Wrath. So let's take a look at what it is and when it is going to start. <clears throat> the first question that we would like to ask today is, when will the Great Day of God's Wrath begin? It's a very important question. Once we talked about that, we will take a look at the actual happenings in that great day of God's wrath. Well, <clears throat> first of all, the Bible tells us that this age will be uh, finishing, will be ending um, with a time period of seven years. Right? The end of this age is not one single day where like everything explodes and, and like you know some movies you can have such a thing but no the Bible tells us the end of this age is actually specified by seven years right and the Bible also tells us when this last seven years of our age today will begin not by giving us a date but by giving us an event and which event is it it is here I wrote it down here it begins with a peace treaty in the Middle East so that the Jewish people, the Jews, God's people on this earth, will worship God on Temple Mount. This prophecy is recorded in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 27. So, once we see the Jews worshiping God on Temple Mount by offering God animal sacrifices, that is the day when the last seven years of this age will begin. This is for sure. This is God's timeline. Then the second point is that this time of seven years is separated into three and a half plus three and a half. So the middle, there's a middle. And the Bible tells us that in the middle of this seven years, this peace covenant that was made here will be broken again. It will be abolished and the sacrifices on Temple Mount will cease. So then the book of Daniel, also the same verse, by the way, tells us that on the day that the peace treaty is broken again, then the great day of God's wrath will begin. And the length of this great day of God's wrath is exactly three and a half years. So the great day of God's wrath, even though it's called day, it's not a day of 24 hours, it's a day meaning to say it's a time span of three and a half years. So God's judgment on this earth will last here for, on, on this earth for three and a half years, not just for a single day. So, and at the end of these three and a half years, we see that 
in the Bible that Jesus Christ will return as the King of Kings to this earth. This is recorded in the book of Revelation. So this is God's timeline for the last seven years of this age. Of course, we don't exactly know when this peace treaty will really be signed. We don't know that, right? Nobody knows. But one thing is for sure, if we look at the current signs, then we see that especially the American government is working very hard and has made that peace treaty a priority of their administration. And just give you one example, that uh, on June 25th this year, so it's a couple of weeks ago, uh, part one of the peace plan was presented uh, in Bahrain, in the Middle East, where uh, the administration laid out a plan how to implement peace in Israel. And not only, in Israel, not only with the Israelis, but also with especially the Arab nations around Israel. So that was very recently, actually you can download this document and take a look at it. It's online on the uh, website of the White House. And you can take a look how that peace plan looks like. And there will be a second part presented sometime, maybe end of this year, which will lay out the political issues of that peace plan. This part one deals with the econ economic part. So if this peace plan is the one that Daniel chapter 9 27 talks about and if it happens to be signed soon then we know that the last seven years of this age will begin soon and that means that the great day of God's wrath will also be starting soon. So now let's take a look, um, we will come back to this chart later, but now let's take a look at uh, another sign that tells us that peace is important. In 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 3 in the Bible, we can read here, it says, while people are saying peace and security, destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pain on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. So, Paul in the book of Thessalonians already told us when this destruction, which refers to the great day of God's wrath, will hit this earth, it is when people say peace and security. So, if we take a look at one of the news that I recently saw, we find that uh, the slogan of the peace plan that they're making right now is indeed peace and security in the Middle East. So um, this news uh, uh, should show us that this word of God here in 1 Thessalonians is truly fulfilled. So <clears throat> if this peace plan is going to be signed in our time, then this world has not much time left before God will judge this earth. Now, let's take a look at how God judges this earth. So the content of the great day of God's wrath. The same timeline as before. We have the last seven years here, the peace treaty being broken in the middle of the week of the seven years. And that is the beginning of the great day of God's wrath. So now the great day of God's wrath doesn't just begin without any warning. God is a very merciful God and very gracious. And before he does something to judge, he wants people to know. He wants us to realize that something is coming. Therefore, God gives us an initial warning to indicate that God's warning, that God's wrath is very, very near. Right? And this first initial warning is called the sixth seal. In the Bible there are several seals that Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God is opening up. You can read that on your own in the book of Revelation. And then there's a seal with the number six and that sixth seal is God's initial warning that the day of God's wrath is very very near. So of course it will, the, the warning will be issued shortly before 
this three and a half years. So what does the sixth seal say? I'm just going to read it to you. It's, re it's the book of Revelation chapter 6 now. Uh, here John uh, who saw this vision said, I looked when he opened the sixth seal and behold there was a great earthquake. Now that's point one. There will be a great earthquake worldwide that will be announcing the arrival of the great day of God's wrath. What else? And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And then a couple of verses later, it says, For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? This is exactly the title of our presentation. So it's directly a Bible verse. It's verse 17 in Revelation 6. So we see that the sixth seal is a warning of God by shaking up the whole earth such that even every mountain and every island on this planet will be moved out of its place. Right? At such an earthquake, everybody will now know that this is not something natural. It is something greater. We were just in California a couple of weeks ago and we experienced two tiny earthquakes in Southern California. Maybe you have read it, it was in the news and we happened to be there. So we were sitting in a meeting like this, right? And suddenly <laughs> the earth and the floor started to shake. I was like, oh, what is this? And for me, it was the first time to experience an earthquake. I haven't experienced that before. So, but that was a very tiny earthquake. I don't know how many seconds, a couple of, maybe a minute or so, and that was over. And nothing collapsed, nothing broke down. It was all okay. But this earthquake here, the earthquake at the sixth seal, is an earthquake that will shake up the whole earth. And it will not only move chairs away, but every mountain and every island on this planet. And then everybody will know, oh, God's judgment is about to come. So we have to realize here, God's warning shortly before his wrath is actually coming is a very clear warning. And on that, on that day, everybody knows something's going to happen. Now, <clears throat> once the warning is issued, there is a time of introduction. God is not right away starting with his three and a half years. As I said, because of his love, he starts slowly. He will go ahead and provide an introduction. And in the Bible, this introduction of the great day of God's wrath is called the first four trumpets. In the book of Revelation, you have seven trumpets that are being blown. And the first four trumpets of these seven, they are a warning, an introduction for the great day of God's wrath. And we don't have the time to read through it all, but I indicated uh, the verses here that you can read it yourself in Revelation 8. So just a few things of that that is going to happen in the introduction is in that time one-third of all the trees on this planet will be burned up. One-third. Every third tree. I don't know how many million trees that is going to be. It will be burned. And then all the green grass. Can't imagine that. that all the grass will be affected. And then even one-third of the sea will turn into blood. It's amazing. And of course, because of that, one third of the living creatures in the sea, they will be killed. One third of all the ships on the ocean will be destroyed. One third of the waters will become bitter. Drinking waters, springs, and fountains. Can you imagine how many people 
will lose their lives in that time when one third of the drinking water becomes bitter. That's terrible. One third of the sun, the moon and the stars will be darkened. They will lose their light. One third. So very severe warning and introduction of this great day of God's wrath. And imagine we have not yet arrived on the great day of God's wrath. This is only the introduction. We, have, we are not here yet. Well, that's how severe it's going to be. Now, let's take a look at the event that is actually starting the great day of God's wrath. So the middle of this seven years. And the actual start will be the fifth trumpet, right? These are the first four trumpets. And the fifth trumpet is the one that marks the middle of these seven years and hence the actual beginning of the great day of God's wrath. Let me just read it to you. It's in Revelation chapter 9. John says, And I saw a star fallen from heaven to, er to the earth. To him, to the star, was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit, like the smoke of a great furnace. And out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth. And they were not given authority to kill men, but to torment them for five months. And they had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. This fifth trumpet marks the beginning of God's wrath. So we see a star here fallen from heaven and in the whole context of the book of Revelation we can see and we find that this star is Satan himself. It's the devil. He is being cast down to this earth. You know, nowadays the, the devil is somewhere in the heavens somewhere. But on that day, in the middle of these seven years, something great will happen that this Satan the devil himself will be cast down to this earth. That means he is now really bound to, to this fear of the earth. And then we see he has a key opening an, a pit, a bottomless pit, and a smoke came out with all the locusts coming out. Let's take a look quickly at what that is. I summarize it here on the next slide. So in this fifth trumpet, Satan himself and his angels are cast down onto the earth. So what happens here? Satan has no more space in heaven at that time. That means he is limited to this earth. That means Satan at that time, he can't do much more than what we can do. Right? He can jump as high as you can jump. He can't like suddenly run away into the heavens. No, he is bound to this earth. Then second, he has a great wrath, the Bible says, because he only has three and a half years. His time is short. So his wrath is great. And a third point is he will make war with Christians and Jews that are still living on this earth and overcoming them. So that's a very severe thing. The devil himself, being on this earth, will persecute God's people. It's very, very strong. The second point is that the beast, the Antichrist, will rise at that time from the bottomless pit. So when this devil takes the key and opens the bottomless pit and the smoke comes out, there's one guy coming out who is called, we, we said it, it's called Ap Abaddon or Apollyon, which means translated destroyer. It's just destroyer. It's a translation in English. And this destroyer is, in other portions of the Bible, he's called the beast or the Antichrist. It's a man who will rule on this earth for three and a half years with a terrible, horrible rule to destroy this whole earth. So a few things that he is going to do is, first of all, he will break the peace treaty. 
Remember we, we talked about that in the middle of the seven years, the peace will be broken. So who will break it? It will be the beast. He will break the peace treaty. Then he will proclaim himself to be God. Meaning to say, he will abolish all religions, especially Christianity that is the system of Babylon. Right? The Bible tells us that during these three and a half years, the beast, the Antichrist, he will be the only religion on this earth because he will persecute any other religion that does not worship him. So there will be a new so-called religion on this earth, meaning to say one God and this so-called God, he's, of course he proclaims himself, he's not God, and will be the beast and everybody has to worship him and fall down before him. So this is something that is going to happen and he will also destroy every Christian item and symbol on this globe completely. He will burn down all the churches and persecute, and that's the last point, and kill all the Christians and the Jews that are still living on this earth at that time. So the persecution is double. He will be persecuted by the devil, first himself, and second, there is also a persecution by a man who I don't really like to call a man because he's really a beast. And although he is a human being, but he's a beast that is really doing all kinds of terrible things. So the third point is that demons will rise from the bottomless pit. Remember the smoke with all the locusts? All these locusts are not grasshoppers from out there, no. They are demonic locusts. They are the demons who have been locked up in the bottomless pit for thousands of years. When God at that time judged the demons, he locked them up in a place called the bottomless pit. It's somewhere underneath the ocean, far deep there. All the demons are being locked up like in a jail, in prison. And they are waiting there. They are waiting there for what? They are waiting there until the star, the devil, come, will come with his key and open this bottomless pit. And once it's open, all those enraged and wrathful demons that have been locked up, they will all come out at the same time like a smoke filling the whole earth. That's a terrible thing. And of course, demons are creatures that, that can take all kinds of forms, right? To torment man. Remember in the Bible, and when Jesus was on this earth, he cast out many demons. And whenever they, he cast out the demons, these demons were trying to find any kind of body that they can possess. Sometimes even pigs <laughs> to possess and to do all crazy stuff, right? So these demons, they are there to possess and they change their form. For example, these terrifying locusts and all sorts of things and they will all be on this earth. So it's really not a good place to be when this thing happens. I don't want to be here. It's going to be really, really horrible, terrible. So another form that these demons can take is described in the next trumpet, which is the sixth trumpet. Remember we talked about the first four trumpets as an introduction. The fifth trumpet is this one. This is actually a summary of the fifth trumpet. And now the sixth trumpet has to do again with these demons. So what is the sixth trumpet? The sixth trumpet is this one. It's written in Revelation chapter 9. Let me read it to you what the sixth trumpet has. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. 200 million. So at that time there will be some kind of demonic horsemen that are riding around this earth. Right? And then it says, I heard the number of them and thus I saw the horses in the vision. Now that's how they look like. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue and sulfur yellow 
And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. But these three plagues, by these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouth. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they do harm. My goodness. Have you ever seen such creatures before? They are demonic horsemen who are there, 200 million of them, killing one-third of the whole Earth's population. One-third. That's like how much? Two to three billion people. And that's a sixth trumpet. That's terrible. I don't want to meet those guys. Now, this is the sixth trumpet. The seventh trumpet concerns now especially the kingdom of the beast. And the seventh trumpet actually contains seven bowls of the wrath of God. So once the seventh trumpet is blown, God will pour out seven bowls of God's wrath onto the kingdom of the beast. And uh, I just wrote down what they contain, these loathsome sores on man. They will be all sick from head to toe. The whole sea, the ocean, will turn into blood. All the waters will turn into blood. There will be an intense, great heat, so that not even air conditioning can really help you. It's going to be horrible. There will be darkness everywhere and pain. Euphrates will dry up, the river in the Middle East, it will dry up. And there will be the greatest earthquake ever, and hail like basketballs in size. <laughs> That's a terrible thing. I don't want to have such a hail, nor such a great earthquake. And that whole bowls, they will all together result in the war at Armageddon. I will talk about that in a bit, but then the last point here is a positive point. Uh, the seventh trumpet we should not forget. At that time, God's eternal kingdom will be established on this earth. That's wonderful. So the seventh trumpet is where Christ will reign as king on this earth forever and ever. That's too great. And we are looking forward to that kingdom. And that's our hope and our goal, right? So now, we talked a little bit about Armageddon. Armageddon is actually a place in northern Israel. You can see it on top there, Mount Megiddo, which is Armageddon means just Mount Megiddo. It's a mountain and a valley, of course, there at the north of Israel. And from there, the Bible says, all the nations and the armies of the whole world will gather at that point. They will all gather here. All the armies, the whole world, will come together. And what will they do? They target Jerusalem. Once and again, they will move toward Jerusalem and lay a siege on Jerusalem, surrounding Jerusalem, trying to conquer it and to destroy the whole city and abolish all of God's people. That's their goal. They want to destroy Jerusalem and they want to destroy Israel. Just like some voices that we are seeing today in the media uh, already calling for the destruction of that place. Right? We've seen that and you can take a look at it yourself. In that day, they will really do it. They will all come to Armageddon and from there start a siege. And the Bible tells that it will go down all the way to approximately this place. And they will actually occupy the whole of Israel, wanting to take Jerusalem and to fully destroy it. But the good news is it won't happen. Because at that time when all the nations surround Jerusalem, it is exactly at that time when the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, will come back to this earth. And the Bible tells us he comes back not to Toronto, no, he comes back to Jerusalem. And to be specific, he will stand on the Mount of Olives. 
right? And so in, at that time, you have to imagine that all the armies of the world will be around Jerusalem. Then suddenly, the Messiah will come down and step his foot on Mount Olive. And in that time, it's so wonderful that Jesus Christ, and he is accompanied by an army at that time, a heavenly army, he will destroy all these armies that are surrounding Jerusalem. This is what is written here. Let me read it to you here. Then I saw the beast, the kings of the earth. Of course, the beast is the Antichrist. And the kings of the earth are all the armies with him. Now they're all, all together. And their armies, they gather together to make war against him, which is Christ, and against his army. So see, Christ also has an army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, and these two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. Wonderful. So this is truly the end of the beast. He will be cast into the lake of fire by Christ himself. What a wonderful sight this is. So and what is going to happen with his army? Well, the rest were killed and all the birds were filled with their flesh. So at that time, Jesus Christ will terminate all the armies that were surrounding Jerusalem and then opening up a great feast for the birds. So how wonderful is this that God has even prepared a meal for the birds and they will clean it all up. So it's very ecological. Yeah, God is, you know, wonderful how he does it. Now, <clears throat> this is of course, the end of the great day of God's wrath, because the beast is being fully destroyed. Now, this is all recorded in the book of Revelation. And today I would like to read to you another portion of the scriptures, which relates to the great day of God's wrath. But it's not in the book of Revelation, but it's a prophecy recorded by Isaiah. Three, a couple of hundred years before Christ, he also wrote concerning that day. Let me read it to you what he says. It's his view and that's what's going to happen. Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste, distorts the surface and scatters abroad its inhabitants. The land shall be entirely emptied and utterly plundered for the Lord has spoken this word. Wow, that's a very severe judgment. Therefore, the curse has devoured the earth, and those who dwell in it are desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and only few men are left. Can you imagine? Few men are left. It's amazing. When it shall be thus in the midst of the land among the people, it shall be like the shaking of an olive tree, like the gleaning of grapes, when the vintage is done. <laughs> what, a, what a picture. Can you imagine you're trying to harvest olives from a tree and you shake it and everything is falling down and you're harvesting the olives and you make sure that everything is gone and then you take away the harvest and then you come back to the tree. How many olives will be left on the tree? Those that were forgotten apparently, right? Maybe two or three, five maybe. Isaiah says, this is how it's going to be like after the great day of God's wrath. So the earth, he says here, is violently, violently broken. The earth is split open, my goodness. The earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. You know, have you ever seen a drunkard? You're drunken, you, know, like, you don't know if you're walking straight and gaffed and right. And that's how the earth is going to be. That means the whole physics of the earth will be totally messed up. It will not be as stable as this is now. We can sit here, it's very stable, nothing's going to happen. But in that day, all these physics will be shaken. And it will really go to and fro and shall totter like a hut. You know, like a tent in the wind. When a wind comes, it's like blown away. 
Its transgression shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. So this is the reason why God judges the earth. It's because of the transgression of the inhabitants. Now, <clears throat> let me come back to this timeline. We have already spoken about part one being released of the peace plan in June 25th. We have already seen also that the peace treaty can be signed anytime. So now, for the sake of uh, clarity, let's just assume that the peace treaty is signed in October 2020. It's just an assumption so that we can see some numbers and get a feeling of how close it really is. So suppose it is going to happen in October 2020. That means that the great day of God's wrath will actually begin in April 2024, if we make this assumption. So it's not that far away. Today we're in 2019. And uh, it's likely that it's going to happen. Of course, we don't know fully yet, but there's a, quite a likelihood that it's going to happen. And if we assume that, it's going to be very, very near. Now, the big question is for us today. What can we do to avoid being here? So if I ask you today, would you like to go through the last three and a half years of this age? Would you like to taste the wrath of God for three and a half years? Who wants to be there when this happens? Anyone? Volunteer? Volunteers? No. I don't think any reasonable man wants to be here. And I want to say that this is exactly the reason why the book of Revelation and the book of Isaiah and a few other books Describe all of that to us. Why? Because the Bible wants us to know. So that we today have a choice. So that today we can do something about it. Right? Of course, if, if God gives us all this information and we are stuck and there's no way for us that, to escape, then, okay, it's good that it's written, but we have no way to change. So the reason why all this is recorded in the Bible is that we today who live in this time will have a chance to avoid and not be there when this great day of God's wrath hits the earth. That's great. I'm, I really thank God that he gives us this opportunity. So if we ask ourselves now what is the way. How can I escape the wrath of God? What, what do I do? Suppose this is true, then that means we will all be here when it's going to happen. Most likely, we assume that we don't pass away. We, we hope we will still live. But assume that this is the calculation. We will all be around during that time. So now we have to ask a question. What needs to be done? What should we do in order to avoid this? Well, the Bible tells us there is only one way for us living people or our life to avoid this great day of God's wrath. There's only one way. Unless passing away before that. Okay, we rule that out now for, for the time being. But there's only one way that if we who are alive that we could actually escape this great day of God's wrath. And this is recorded in the book of Revelation. Jesus himself says here, because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. And this hour of trial is exactly the three and a half years of great tribulation. So the Jesus here, he says that if we are keeping his word or command to persevere, he will also keep us so that we don't have to go through that. So how is he going to do that? How does the Lord Jesus keep us from the hour of trial? Well, he does it by the means of rapture. Rapture means it is an event that when Jesus comes back will pick up those Christians 
who are ready, who are prepared, and bring them to God, to his throne, to the heavenly Mount Zion, for the following three and a half years. That's what Jesus Christ will do. That's the way how he will keep us from the hour of trial. But the Bible shows us that only the faithful Christians will be raptured to God. And that's a very important statement here that we should see not all Christians will be raptured to God to be spared of the last three and a half years. Only a fraction. And the Bible actually tells us it is only a small remnant, a small group of people who will be raptured before the great day of God's wrath begins. So then we have to ask the question, what is happening with all the rest? Well, simple. The majority of the Christians will be left behind. They will be left behind. Those Christians, and I'm not talking about unbelievers or people of other religions, I'm talking about Christians, those who have received Jesus into their heart, who are born again believers. Amongst them, only a small fraction will be taken up by God, while the majority will have to go through and experience each and every trial that I have already talked about in this presentation. Now, I want to just give you two verses to prove that there are definitely Christians living in these last three and a half years. There are many proofs, but I want to just give you two verses. Also from the book of Revelation, it's black, so you match the color here, black. In Revelation 12, it says, The dragon went to make war with the rest of her offspring. Who are these? who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So this verse shows us, the first one, that the dragon, which is the devil, he will make war with those who have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Those are the Christians. Very clear. So if the dragon can make war with the Christians, that means they have to be left behind. Otherwise, where do they come from? they were left behind. The second verse in Revelation 13 says, it was granted to him, and that's the beast, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. <laughs> so if the beast makes war with the saints, the saints in the Bible are is referred to the believers, the Christians. They are. Every epistle of Paul starts with greetings to the saints, right? The saints here, the saints in different localities. So the saints are not people who died in the past and somebody said they're holy. No, the saints in the Bible are just another term for believers. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you're also a saint. So and that verse shows us that the beast will make war with the saints during the last three and a half years. So these two simple verses should show us that there will be Christians living on this earth in this last three and a half years. So for us today, we have to make sure that we prepare well. Let us prepare today. Why? Because God says in 1 Thessalonians 5, God did not appoint us to wrath. No, it's not for us to be there, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. This verse refers to the wrath of the last three and a half years. So God in his love does not want that any one of us goes through the last three and a half years. He doesn't want that. He wants us to be taken up to him. But it depends on us today whether or not we will prepare. As I said, not every Christian will just be taken to heavens just like that. No, it requires a preparation. I have to prepare. I have to live a serious Christian life today. I have to learn to live by Christ day by day, to grow, mature, 
spiritually. If I don't care for my spiritual growth, I don't be, I'm not transformed into the image of Christ. And there's no change in me toward the goal, toward Jesus Christ. Then when Jesus comes back, or when that time comes, do you think he's going to just pick me up like that? No, he won't. I have to prepare. And today, I'm so thankful that God has given us many, many signs and warnings and also practical help how to prepare for the coming of the great day of God's wrath so that we will not taste it. So and I encourage myself, first of all, and then you all to really prepare well. To prepare because this time is at hand, it's very near and we have a very high chance to experience it. So I hope that today we get an impression and we will seek God seriously and tell him, Lord Jesus, I want to be saved fully before you come. So this is the end of my presentation for now and now if anyone has a question, we can